made into what? We better pay attention. The times are close at hand. What's being done in the flesh is not important. What is the spiritual message that they're sending people out there today? Okay, Mark, you can take that one off. But here's the magazine if you want to read the article about it. Uh, I have it up here. Uh, my book is out now. It's all over the world as of this morning. On Amazon, there's a web page from Amazon. You go on the computer and they have it listed for $22. That's this hard copy. And uh, they have the uh, soft copy listed for $11.70 on Amazon. Uh, here's a guy in Florida who claims to have a copy, a hard copy that's used, and he says he wants $45.84 for it. So I don't know. <laughs> I guess if you want to use it, you have to pay double. Kind of like the option John went to, he said last night. He could have bought the stuff at Walmart cheaper than do and brought it there and sold it. I don't know. And then Barnes and Noble have have it. And on Barnes and Noble, the hard copy is twenty-one seventy-eight, and the soft copy is eleven dollars and eleven cents. So it's less there. Why I don't know. And then um, there's uh, four more websites here that have it. Uh, book catcher is twenty-three twenty-nine. Brand new goods us is twenty-four forty-nine, and Mirian USA has a 92% positive over the past 12 months, it says, it's $33. Now, <laughs> I don't know what all that's about, but from Author House, my publisher, the book is listed for the hardcover at $13.68. <laughs> but you figure it out. And uh, the soft cover is $8.69. There's, there's the websites. If you want to get a copy of it, and we're going to try to have them send me some. I got two complimentary copies that go to the author. That's all the only ones they give me on it. So if we want any, I guess we'll have to buy them. So if you want to get some, we maybe we'll get some from the, uh, you know, get a bunch of you together and we'll order one thing and they'll send them like that. Uh, the message this morning, I want to talk about uh, parables. And I ask God to come into our midst and let God bless this uh, message this morning. Would you turn off this one right there? The one on the right. It's, it's uh, putting, yeah, it's glaring the screen. That's good. Where I can see, uh, I was back there this morning uh, while Mark was having Sunday school because the message that I was going to <laughs> preach this morning uh, is here. It's actually my funeral preaching my funeral. Okay? I am ready to go home. Now, since I'm not going to be here for it, I figured I'd better go ahead and get it done. So you'll hear about that this evening. Well, I'm going to be here, but I'm not going to be up here preaching. Okay? So somebody else is going to have to preach it. So uh, I'm, I'm listing a few things in it. So it's, I'm going to be preaching my funeral this evening. Uh, I went to the VA, like I was telling you, yesterday. And um, I don't know if you know anything about blood pressure and stuff like that, but I mine was 70 over uh, 78 over 110. My blood pressure 78 over 110. Uh, 110 over 78. 110 over 78. Well, whatever it was. It's very good. Anyway, he said it was something like I was about 18 or 19 years old. So uh, I'm not in bad shape. So I'm not fixing to die. Okay, so I'm not preaching a message because I'm fixing to die. Uh, he said he did find, he found in the, in the test that they done, he said he found some uh, blood in my urine. He didn't know what it was there for. I said, well, it was probably there for that virus where the devil attacked me this week. I guess y'all know about that. I said, it was probably that and nothing more. He said, well, whatever. He wants me to come back and he got two tests he wanted to run on me. One of them is for make me drink this chalky stuff and he's going to x-ray me. 
He said, the other one's a CT scan. Because you um, you know I've had some hurting in my side a couple of times when I've been up here praying. And some demon might have got a hold of me there. And, you know, faith without works. I want you to know something. Faith without works is dead. Okay? If God shows you you need to do something, and God doesn't take it away from you, and God say to you, you need to let the doctors do it. You need to have it checked out. If you don't have it checked out, then you're saying to God, I don't believe these symptoms or whatever you sent me are from you. I don't believe a thing that you're saying. So we need to realize that God gives us a wake-up call from time to time. You know? And if there's a problem, eliminate that problem up front. Don't sit back like a, oh, I know everything and God don't know nothing. God can heal us right now. At the drop of a hat, He can heal us and, it, and that's the end of it, you know. But what if God chooses to use a doctor to do it? But what if you take it a little further? You see, this book is written in parables, and I'm going to explain to you about that in a minute. But what if God put a parable in, in our life? I want you to go to the doctor and have the doctor check you out because I want to test your faith. And what does that mean? Well, are you going to be believing that the doctor's going to heal you? Or he's going to do the healing? You see what I mean? God needs to know our hearts. And as you'll find out, as you read, if you get a copy and you read my book, You'll find out this is what I'm talking about in there. If you're not a spiritual person, you will not understand my book. Don't bother uh, buying it because it probably won't do nothing but make you mad. So you might want to leave it alone. Only if you're spiritual because the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. And neither can he know it. They're spiritually discerned. So if, you, if you're still going to live in the flesh and you're not wishing to progress, don't buy a copy of the book because all it's going to do is make you mad. This book is written in parables and I, I may talk not just to the flesh man but the spirit man within. It has an earthly meaning, yes, or an earthly depiction of something that's happening, but it has a heavenly meaning. Okay, uh, I want to say this again. Don't buy one of these books if you don't want to see a change in your life. Like even some people's eternal destiny could be changed over this. Uh, I want to show you something. As you, as you look and you open up the book to the front page, So know right off with everything 
that this is written to a, a spiritual person. When you read this book, you're going to find some repulsive things that are said in here. God wants to know people's hearts. The rapture is fixing to happen. We got a lot of people playing church. Okay? And they're saying this and they're saying that, but their heart is not with God. So, how does God know where you're at? How does God know what you're doing? Now, to, to begin the book, I make a forward part of it. The first thing you find on page two is a poem. And it's entitled, To an Angry World. Let me read it. Why are you standing there looking up? Do you care that I am here? I have even died for you. Do you even care? I have held you in my hands. Even knew you before you were. You looked away from me to others. Now you're shackled in his hands. Will you just stay the way you are? How I tried to show you how. Then love together would have seen how miraculous I send the end. Now look to me, not just standing there. Care for them the way they are. I'll care for you the same. I can't die for you again. And that's by his witness again, me. And again, this is a work of God. And this warning that's on here is from God. If you are going to take and and try to use this as whatever, then it's not going to be used the way uh, God wants you to use it. So everything here is a work. And God asks the question, entitled. He's asking your spirit. You see, he's reaching inside of you right off, asking you a question. Why are you just standing there? And what do you mean by that? Well, why aren't you on your knees praying? Huh? Or why aren't you helping somebody? Why are you just standing there? He's called every one of us to a service. This book's about Christians. This book's about how Christians live their lives. This afternoon you're going to see a movie and uh, you can decide in your life what you think about how they live theirs and what they do. Uh, everything in this book is a work of God. So I suppose many will be here at this church after reading this. They want to see this idiot, me, because they're going to be angry about some of the things written inside of the book. They're going to come here to try to say that I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, when the publisher was at the verge of not letting me publish this book because they thought it had more content of the Word of God in it than what the law allows. It can't have one third of the Bible written in it or more. So they started not to publish it to begin with because it was so full of God's Word. You see, they put my name on the, on here, which I didn't know that until I got the book. I designed it with the cover and the name on it with the lightning and such, and I thought my name would be on the side, you know, in smaller print. But there it is on the front of it. But we already read who the author was. It's God and not me. Okay? And so we're going to find out that other people are going to take it the same way. They're going to take it in a fleshly application, which is okay too because what Mark talked about, the sin of homosexuality, I show every instance that the Bible talks about that in this book. Nothing, anybody, no, no word that anybody could possibly come up with and say that's not listed in here that's in the Bible. Every verse that's in the Bible just about I've got in this book. Now, I, I, I put in there that I'm not in here to run somebody down. I want you to know that God loves in people too. Don't, don't come to me telling me you hate these people and oh, they're disgusting and they're this and they're that because you're living in the flesh. We need to realize if we're spirit, 
spiritual man judges all things, and he himself is judged of no man. So look at that yourself. When you judge righteous judgment, then you are judged by no man. And that means your spirit, man, is right with God. God wants to know how we are. God doesn't want another devil trying to get into his heaven. And if you've got the devil inside of you, and you're playing church, God wants to know about it. And he wants to know about it before the rapture happens. So, I put it here in one place to show you that this book is full of parables. I just off the top of my head, I was writing this back here this morning. And um, one place in here I talk about the parole board under attack by Y2K man. Now some people might take that and construe that as I got angry with this person or at least group of people or whatever. But I want you to know, read it. It is a life experience, maybe for some people. Uh, it may well be true in some cases as you read the book. But as you read it, understand this is, this is the parole board here. The church. Okay. There are people dressed as ninjas in the ending part of this book, they are dressed as ninjas and they are, are shooting, attacking the parole board. This is the devil and his people disguised. Now, haven't you seen them dress up in these black outfits with a little piece of white on their collar? Religious law keepers. They, they wear their robes and they, all the things that they do. And the first thing they want to do is attack righteous preaching. Okay? This is what these ninjas are. They're out there attacking God's church. So remember, these are parables in this book. They're not um, uh, well, they are if you want to think they are real life things. Then I have a young boy hitchhiking. And he is picked up and it has a heavenly meaning in it as well. And so as you go through these, don't just look at the earthly picture that you're, you're seeing. All I'm saying is don't just look at the earthly picture you're seeing. I want to talk to your spirit, man. So as, as I talk, or God talks to your spirit, man, I say I because I'm the one doing the writing. spirit man, he can understand your heart. Some people might get uh, offended. Some people might find it uh, uh, joyful to read some of the things that's in here and love it. Some people may be so disgusted with it, they're just ready to chew the nails, you know. I just, you have to expect this is going to happen because we are not all in the same uh, spiritual condition. Man is in a lost, poor, miserable condition. And if all we're going to do is look at our life for me, you want to know one of the ways God looks at our spiritual condition? Is every time we open our mouth, does I come out of it? I is not. I is, is the middle of sin. You know, if I comes out of our mouth all the time, God knows what we have in our heart. Love of self. You don't know your own spiritual condition. You don't know yourself the way God knows you. You don't see yourself as God sees you. We are poor, wretched, miserable, lost in sin, nothing that we can do to help ourselves. And if we cannot see what's going on, how can we help someone else? God has to take us aside. He has to separate us from ourselves. And the only way that God can look into our heart, the Bible tells us, without a parable spoke He not unto them. But He explained things from time to time with them. And we're going to see how God did that here in a few minutes. So, 
when you see what's going on, it's like I get down here and I show you these boots up here. If it makes you angry, it means there's something in you that needs to be changed. God says, hey, you've got something wrong. We need to talk. You need to come to the altar. If you hate me because I don't hate homosexuals, you've got a problem. Yo, know, I think they're going to hell, yes. But liars are going to hell as well. And thieves. Okay? So don't single out one race or one kind of people and all oh, there is no good and they're this and they're that because then you're out there bashing. Queer bashing is what I call it. We need to get out of this syndrome and get into the Jesus syndrome. We need to get born again. We need to have a heart that has love in it. And knowing, yeah, now, I'm not saying get out here and get down in the mess and get down in and roll around with them. <laughs> Be a homosexual. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying to condone their lifestyle. Don't get me wrong. When I'm up here talking about love and you love the person that hate the sin. Just like you might love the dog and hate the bark. You know, you might love the person and hate the cancer. We got to learn to this between the two of them. We can't just live our lives and say, oh, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And you either are on this side of it or you're not. God is love. God loved the whole world. That means faggots, if you want to call them that this morning. That means robbers, murderers. God so loved the whole world that He sent His only Son down here to die on the cross for Him. What is wrong with our hard hearts this morning that we also can't love them? <laughs> and so this book, how can I just stand up and just say, you've got to love people and you've got to do this and you've got to... I can't do that because you won't listen. The world won't listen to God. Why can they listen to me? Look how many empty views we've got here this morning. If they wanted to hear God's word, then why ain't they here? It's because of I getting in the way this morning. That's why I don't feel like getting up. I want to do this. I want to do that. What? And they come to church when they feel like it. And then the rapture happens and they don't go up. Well, God, you're unjust. You didn't take me up because I came to church. I got news for you. God's going to know if you're ready to go up. Well, if He's going to need for you to stay here through the tribulation, because Revelation 9 and 21 says, Neither did they repent. How many people's going to die in your family before you're going to give up the world and know that one day I want to go? I want to go to that heavenly home. I don't want to spend my life in hell for eternity. When are we going to get it through our heads? There is a God who loves us, who cares for us, and wants us to be like He is. So, God said His word. He said His word. Thus saith the Lord. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. John 1 and 1. And the Word was God. The Word of God is God Himself. So when we're up here preaching, thus saith the Lord, it may as well be Jesus standing up here to tell you the plain, simple truth. If we're in the Spirit, it is Jesus standing here. Because Jesus is the Word of God. And these churches that are changing it, they're trying to change Jesus. Can't you see what's going on? We need to get into the Spirit and get out of the flesh because the flesh is taking us to hell. But some people, you can't reach if you don't get into the flesh. So you have to come up with a fleshly story that sounds and, and caters to their hunger and their thirst after sin. But yet in that hunger and thirst after sin, there's God still there speaking to their fear 
for somebody, not for I this and I that. Got an eye problem, you need to come to the altar. God in his infinite wisdom has his book written as we see the day approaching. And so many people need to come to the altar. And more so than just come up here to say I'm praying for so and so. They need to come here and pray for themselves. I'm going to have tears in heaven, church. I'm telling you, I'm going to be crying when I get to heaven. Because when I get to heaven, I'm going to look back here and I'm going to see some people. I'm going to be standing in heaven one day and I'm going to see some of the people in hell running that were sitting in the church and I couldn't get through to them. I didn't have the words to say. And I think about that so much. And I listen to my God. And my God says, I didn't have the words to say either. I said, Lord, you're God and you didn't have the words to say. He said, no, I'm sorry. Think about it this morning. God sent his only son down here and died on the cross for us. He said, hey, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He said, I love you. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, repent. Turn from your wicked ways. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, and pray and turn from your wicked ways then will I hear your voice I'll heal your land but they won't people's coming into God's house every day and they're playing church they're not coming in here in the spirit they're coming in here as creatures of the flesh oh I didn't have time to come to church today I had to do this I Tell them what you have to say and be done with them. 
But make up your mind where you're at. You see so many indecisions. Well, I'm going to do this, but if something comes up, I'm not going to church. <laughs> That's the way it is. Oh, i got to go do this. I'm not going to church. I can go to church anytime, but I can't do this anytime. You know, if you don't like what I'm writing, you've got a problem. If you don't like what I'm preaching up here, you've got a problem. You need to do something about it. This is you and God now. Don't let somebody that lives around you or whatever cause you to have to go to hell. Eternity is going to be an awful long time. If you buy a copy of this book, don't just read it and throw it in the corner. Go back and read it again. Think about it. Like God's Word, you can't read it one time and you're done with it. The devil would love you to do that. Say, okay, I read it all, now I'm done with it. Go back and read it again. See if there's anything in there that you could make some sense out of. Because you're going to read some of it, it's not going to make a bit of sense to you. Why would he say that? Why did he put that part there? Why did this? Why did that? But to begin with, I show a heavenly dream. You see, there's two dreams in there. One about a heavenly dream. And the second is a heavenly dream. But it also is a vile, earthly. It shows sin as what sin is exceedingly sinful. And so, let God open your eyes to the truth on the back of the book. Let me say this. One of my middle name that God gave me is Methuselah Martus Shema. The Martus part of it means in the Greek, that Martus is an English translation of the Greek word martyr. Martyr means someone that was killed in the service for the Lord. I didn't learn that until later years in my life. And so, maybe this is what's going to happen. <clears throat> On the back of the book, one feels the entire world needs to know the Lord before it is too late. That's what's written. Most of the authors have their picture put on there. I refuse. I wanted this one here. One lives in the beautiful mountains of West Virginia close to the Ohio River in a little town called Sistersville. If somebody comes gunning for me, they're going to look for that name. Sistersville is not so big they can't find me. I put it there in a parable, though, didn't I? I didn't give them my address. I gave them a parable. Let them figure it out. Okay? One loves the Lord and knows that he cannot even walk without him holding his hand and knows that he is the God on the mountain and the God in the valley. One is married, has five children, ten grandchildren, one great-grandchild, 66 years of age, has been blessed to have been married 48 years of as of December 21st, 2010. One was lost in sin and apart from God until such a time that God separated himself from himself and called him to do the work of the Lord. One is a pastor of a little country church in Pine Grove, West Virginia and feels the coming of the Lord is soon to be upon us. And this book is inspired to help as many as who wants to go to get ready for his coming in the clouds, as we were told in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 10. While they stood, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. To show you one more instance here, 
that this book is written in parables without me outlining it through the book. Because it's written to spiritual men, yet in this rapture, he will call us all up to himself in the clouds without having set foot on the earth at this point. We need to realize that we are truly living as I begin. 2012 is soon to be upon us. And you have heard from all the different sources of man. <clears throat> but have you heard from God? Read this book and you may just find out that we are truly living in the last days right now. What has caused these events to happen now? The answers are inside this book. For those who are seeking to know the truth and what thus saith the Lord God. And so, as I go to the book of Proverbs, he says, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. He says, Be not among wine bitters, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man with rags. Hearken unto thy father which begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth, and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begat the wise child shall have joy in him. He goes on to say, my son, in verse 27, he says, verse 26, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. For a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as for prey and increases the transgressions among men. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? who have contentions, who have families, who have wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, and it giveth off its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At last it biteth like a serpent, it stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, thine heart shall utter perverse things, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of the mast. Now, I just read you another parable out of God's Word. And I know every one of you thought we were talking about drinking. Probably. Because of the way it was worded, you, you think it was about drinking wine. But it wasn't. A woman in the Bible is always pictured as the church. They're drunk, and he says, with the doctrine that's out there in the world today, because they got a false doctrine. And now you think that everything is going right. You think the world is the way that it's supposed to be. You think I came to church. You think I've done all that I should do, and now I'm right with God. And that's why he says, and they shall say, peace and safety. Some destruction is going to come upon them. Because they're not right with God. Churches all across America are filled with people going to hell. Because they haven't repented. Their lives haven't been changed. Jesus said, there's no way that you're going to get into the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. Proverbs chapter 5. He says, my son, attend unto my wisdom. Bow down. Put it on the screen. What do you want? Here to my understanding. Listen to what he's saying here. In Proverbs chapter 5, he's speaking another parable. If you don't understand these parables, how will you understand all parables? If you don't understand what God's trying to say to you today, if, I, if you can't look past the end of your nose, it's because I is in the way. It's because you let other things get in place of you wanting to come to church. There's other things that takes precedence over your life 
than God's life. He says, My son, attend to my wisdom. Bow your ear to my understanding. You may discard, uh, regard discretion and that the lips may know keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman Sustenance. 
place to lift me up. He says, and uh, let's look in verse 16, where he talks about the horse leech in, in verse 15. He says, she has two daughters. Crying, give, give. <laughs> Who does that sound like to you? Don't that sound like that? Some of these evangelists in these churches, give, 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 give me more money, give, give, give. And there are three things that are never satisfied, four things that say not. It's enough. That's enough. You don't have to give no more. That's, you gave plenty, that's enough. The eye that mocketh and his father despises to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. The grave, he says in verse 16, and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith. It's not enough. It's the same thing that's happening across America in the churches. Every time we got a piece of information from that church of God in Princeton, Tennessee, West Virginia, they was wanting money. They never got enough money. Every time we got a, you're still giving, begging for money. That's all they do. We stand up in this church, will you rob God? Of your tithes and offerings, will you rob God? We're not begging for your money. If you don't want to, if you don't want to pay your tithes, that's up to you. Up to you and God. You know what? Scroll down to verse 20. Who's he talking about again? Look at here. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. We are talking about a church girl here. Someone that's sitting in God's house. I've paid my vows. I've done all I need to do. I just go out there, my lip hanging on the ground, <laughs> mad at the world, hating everybody and everything, no love of God in them, no love of nothing in them, nothing but lovers of self. If you're like that today, you need to come to this altar. You need to read this book several times. You need to do something with your life because you're on your way to hell. I'm sorry. Don't sit up here telling me peace and safety. When you're on your way to hell, there's no peace and safety. We better open up our eyes, open up our minds, open up our hearts. Matthew chapter 13, please, Mark. And I'm going to be winding down here pretty quick, I'm hoping. I just made a few notes back here, like I said, and I wanted to go over them so you'll know what parables is all about. And if this Bible is full of them. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside. Doesn't that tell you something? The sea in the, in the Bible in Revelation chapter 17 that you saw was multitudes, peoples, nations, and tongues. Jesus sat by a lot of people. Okay? And he says great multitudes were gathered so that he had to get into a ship. Today we would say he got into a coliseum or a church or a big building as the whole multitude stood beside to listen to what he said. And it says he spoke many things to them. How? Verse 3, in parables. Many things he spoke to them in parables. And we get the parable of the seed sower here in this chapter. Now verse 9 says, if you have ears to hear. I thought we all had ears. Some of us need a hearing aid, but we all pretty much got ears and we can hear something, can't we? His disciples came, verse 10. How come you're always speaking to them in parables? He says, well, verse 11. It's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But these other people, it ain't given to them. Why? They're not spiritual. They're still operating in the flesh. And the flesh is operated by the devil. You remember Adam and Eve? Flesh man. And as you come into Jesus, you can't become spirit man. You're still flesh man. That's, that's a 
against God. And every 27 traits that is in man is all against God. In the flesh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in the spirit, we're just like he is. 1 John chapter 4 tells us we are just like he is in the spirit. In the flesh, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He said, for whoever has to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whoever has not, even what little he has is going to be taken away. If you think you understand something, and you don't have the Spirit of God, he's going to take away what little you thought you had. But if you're born again, then he's going to multiply what you have. And the whole situation changes then, you see. He says in verse 13, this is why I'm speaking to them in parables. Because they see, see not. They hear, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And so the prophecy Isaiah said about them is fulfilled. Why? Verse 15, for this people's heart is wax gross. What does that mean? They're in love with their self. That's what it means. They're a bunch of religious hypocrites. All they got on their mind is their self. He says their, their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. But if you will open your eyes this morning and hear with your ears, understand with your hearts, and be converted, he says, I will heal you. God can do the healing if you'll let him. If you think you come into this church and you come forward and you made a prayer with a little airhead up here and you think you're going to heaven and your spirit is just like your spirit was, if you don't have love of God in you and you've been living that way your entire life, i got news for you. You're not going to heaven, you're going to hell. Because you, you haven't been converted. You haven't been changed. He says,
men who have divorced their wives because of the hardness of their hearts are not supposed to be preachers and they're standing in God's pulpit preaching going contrary to God's word and they're telling you that it's okay you might better bear with them man. you might better compare scripture with scripture here because God hasn't changed his mind about sin if we read the book of Luke chapter 16 right before we get the parable of the rich man in hell there's a little verse in there it says something like whoever divorces his wife is in danger of hell fire. We better pay attention to God's word. He puts these little thoughts and injects these little things in there from time to time like, oh, well, let me just throw this in here. You know, and we might read over top of it. We might pass it by. We might go, oh, well, it ain't this. Oh, well, it ain't that. He said, the Son of Man is going to come back. And then verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their Father. Do you have ears to hear that this morning? Then you should hear it. Now verse 57. We could go through, but we don't have time to read every one of these verses. And look at here. And they were offended in him. They were offended because Jesus spoke these things. So what do you think they come to think about me? If they had called the master of the house the prince of devils, Beelzebub, how much more would they call these people? He says, so a prophet is not without honor, but is in his own country, in his own house. And verse 58, look at the terrible end to it all. He could do not many miracles there because of their unbelief. Turn now to Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to read through these few verses here. He began to teach here in Mark chapter 4 by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude. So we find the same thing happening here as we find in chapter 13, don't we? The multitude, and there he was, and he's in a little boat sitting by, his, and it says in verse 2, how did he teach them? You see, we need to understand God teaches us through parables. Okay? He taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine. And he, he gives us again the parable of the seed sower. Now verse 9 again, Mark. And how did he say again? He's asking you, do you hear him this morning? Are you listening to him in your spirit? Or have you gotten angry? And you turn him off in your flesh. And you're not letting your spirit hear what he has to say. Verse 11. He says, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without. It's all done in parables. God doesn't want some people to know certain things. He wants born again Christians in heaven. God doesn't want another devil trying to get in his heaven. And he is definitely going to check you out. No, God is not going to tempt you. The book of James says, God tempteth no man, but he's sure going to put you to the test. Adam was put on this earth along with Eve, and they both had temporary righteousness. When you came to this altar, you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior in your spirit. You was imputed with temporary righteousness. You didn't have it before you came to the altar. You was held by When you got your temporary righteousness, now it's got to be put to the test. Jesus was put to the test. He suffered and died on the cross and is now sitting in heaven at the right hand of God. God is going to put every one of His creatures to the test. Are you ready? Are you going to heaven this morning? Think about it. He says, unto you, in verse 11, it's known, right? Then in verse 12, seeing they may see and not understand. And then at the end of that verse, he says, and their sins should be forgiven them. You see, he didn't say that back in Matthew. Here in Mark, he says, and their sins shall be forgiven them. 
Because Matthew was there to write it down, but Matthew missed that part. But what Matthew missed, Mark picked it up. You see? And that's the whole thing when you come to church. If one of us missed something, somebody else is sitting there, maybe they're going to get it. And that's why it's so good for us to fellowship with one another as Christians, not only in the church, but out there in the world. Brother, did you miss that this morning? Well, let me tell you, here's what part you missed then. You see? God has a purpose for everything that He's doing. And, and we need to fall into His divine purpose as to what is going on. Look at verse 13 now. Look at that. And He said to them, You don't know this parable? How do you bring it all parables? You don't know what I'm saying here today? How do you know what the Bible says? Don't come telling me I think this and I think that. If you don't know what God's even talking about, how can you have live on it? We need to get our heads right. We need to get to this altar. We need to be real with God this morning. And we all need to think about, hey, where am I going to be? One last two verses in Luke chapter 8. Where am I going to be this morning? Your spirit should be asking that. Am I really saved? Your spirit's rolling over inside. Have you got the knot in your stomach, baby? A burning feeling within you? Boy, I thought I, thought I, was, I, thought I was okay. Boy, man, have you put some stuff on here this morning? He says in Luke 8, verse 18, Take heed, therefore how you hear. What does that mean, take heed to how you hear? Are you hearing with your flesh? Or are you hearing with your spirit? Is what Jesus is asking us this morning. What are you hearing? Is it just, Or is it, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done? You know what gets me? The Bible says, after much tribulation shall we enter into the kingdom of God. And so many times people think, oh, I must not be much of a Christian since I got all this trouble in my life. But then I read over in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, he says something like, It is not only given unto you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but also to suffer for His sake. There's something about being a Christian and it's a totally different situation than being in the world. Take heed for what you hear, for whatever you have to Him shall be given. And whosoever hath not from him shall be taken even what little bit he seems to have. How many men are going to stand in front of my God one day and say, I was a preacher. Why are you not letting me into heaven? I was a Sunday school teacher. Why aren't you letting me in? And they'll say to Jesus, I did. I was a soul leader in church. Why can't I come into heaven? And they will hear him say, before I never even knew you. They had no relationship with him. There was nothing but a flesh striving there. It has to be another way for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Take heed to what you hear. Not with your mind airhead, but what your spirit is hearing. You must be born again. Then what happened in verse 19? It says, then he came to him his mother and his brothers and could not come to him for the press. His mother and his brothers standing outside. There were so many people that wanted to hear Jesus speak. But yet we just heard back a little ways that they were offended in him. Now there's so many up there pushing that his old mom and daddy and their brothers came in 
sin. We got people who won't come to church because their mama's sick. They won't come to church because their daddy's sick. They won't come to church because their their sister said, I don't like that church. I don't like the way that pastor looks. I don't like the car he drives. I don't like the size of his nose. His belly's too big. He's too fat. He's too skinny. He's too short. He's too tall. You know what? They're doing it for mama and daddy. They're taking heed of what they hear in the flesh, not what they're hearing in the spirit. If somebody's keeping you out of church, it ain't God. God wants you to hear what He has to say this morning. He said, He answered, Who's my mother? Who's my brothers? Who's my sister? They that hear the word of God and what? Do it. Look at verse 21. Hear the word of God and do it. You're going to love someone if you're real. You're going to pray for someone if you're real. You're not going to be so selfish, so greedy, all the time talking about I, me, mine. It's a different situation being a Christian. We need to wake up this morning and smell the coffee brewing in heaven today. God's got something else for us. And it ain't what we see on this earth. It's a heavenly home. Are you ready to go this morning? We're going to have an altar call now. Tonight, like I said, I'm going to preach my funeral. <laughs> I bet some people will be glad to hear that when it really happens. <laughs> I'm going to be happy because I'm going to be home. It's homecoming time. I've already got the song I want to be played. Well, at my funeral, it's called It's Party Time. <laughs> That's a song I want to be played at my funeral. It's called It's Party Time. <laughs> yeah. It's on there. Somebody of the Kings uh, will play it after, after we get done the message this morning. And you can listen to it yourself. It's party time. I'm not going to the grave to stay. Amen. I'm going up in a moment. Just as soon as I lay down this old wore out body, I'm going to pick up a new one. It's just going to be that quick. I don't fear death. I don't fear the devil. I fear myself. That's who I'm afraid of. This, this, this creature I fight with daily. I went to the doctor up there, put me on the scales, and I weighed 253 pounds. And the doctor come up to me after he seen me stand there, he starts patting me, I'm like, what happened to you? And I said, he said, you still driving the truck? I said, no, I'm, I'm retired now. He said, I see, you must be something. Had me on the belly again. I said, yeah, me and my wife are just talking. I'm going to have to lose some weight. He said, oh, will you wait till you come to the doctor to talk about losing weight? <laughs> said, yeah, that's what he told me. You wait until you come to the doctor. About, don't wait until the rapture comes to start thinking about getting saved. That's what went through my mind, you know. Don't wait until you die of a heart attack. I said, maybe I should have lost some weight. But you know what made me realize I need to lose some weight? <coughs> when I came back from Georgia, I weighed 202 pounds. And now I weigh 253 pounds. After your day, Pastor, you get steak where you going to I'm going to have my steak today. But I'm going to be sparingly. The rest of the time for the next year, I'm going to get some of this off of me. I'm not going to leave all of that on there. You know what the doctor said? He pointed to me. He said, that's destroying your heart. I don't look like I'm fat. You better talk to him. <laughs> I can feel it when I feel it in my feet. You know what? If I can feel this in my flesh, you know I need to do something. What is it that we can feel in our spirit this morning? Knowing that we also have to do something up. We need to come to the altar. We all have a minister. There's some things that's going on in our lives. All of us, we've been proud. Yeah, don't tell me you haven't. I've listened to some of y'all's conversation. 
and all I could see is a great big eye standing in front of me. <laughs> you know, you, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. You know, and one more thing that goes with that: you can't fool God none of the time. He knows where we're at. You know, so we need to get to this altar, and we need to talk to Him. Is your heart right, Lord? I, I, I can't do it on my own. Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Lord, if you'll just help me, I want to do what's right. But Lord, I do need your help. I can't do it myself. Lord, when I leave here tonight, and I go back out there in the world tomorrow, Lord, I know what I'm going to face. Devils are going to be after me. And Lord, I'm going to need your help. As a matter of fact, Lord, I'm going to need some more help. I'm going to need you to send some angels because I ain't going to be able to make it by myself. So, Lord, let me hang on to one of them's hand while I'm walking. Lord, let me have your word while I'm thinking, while I'm sitting, while I'm talking. Lord, just put your heart and your laws within me. Take away this stony heart and give me a heart of flesh like you would have it 